And if I seem a bit hot and sweaty up here, you'll know the reason why. All right, please take your Bibles and turn over to the book of Revelation. I hope we can get through most of this at least tonight because there's some really incredible stuff about the church at Ephesus that I want to talk to you about tonight to see what happened in church history and how Ephesus finally fell. How that church finally got jerked out of its position. Because we know, we don't have any question about it, we know what happened. And uh, there's something that happened at Ephesus that has given rise to some of the greatest apostasy in the world today. The church that was the one that was most doctrinally sound of the seven churches in Asia Minor, the church at Ephesus, what happened there, it will boggle your mind. I hope we can get that far. So we're looking at the doctrine of the Nicolaitans at the church at Ephesus, which resulted in the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which was grotesque immorality, as we saw, because it is paralleled with the doctrine of Balaam. We saw that the way in which Satan gained his foothold at Ephesus resulted later in two incredible doctrinal points of compromise. We saw that Ephesus had lost their first love. We saw that eventually there was a leadership conflict that split the church as Paul warned in Acts chapter 20. We looked at the doctrine of Balaam and analyzed his deeds so that we could know what the deeds of the Nicolaitans were. And it related to pagan worship, eating things offered to idols, and to sexual immorality and to commit things, uh, commit fornication, Revelation 2.14. We saw the parallels with the doctrine of the Nicolaitans and the doctrine of Balaam. We saw that the first error of Balaam was covetousness, the idolatry that we've been talking about somewhat in the morning worship service. The second error of Balaam was willingness to twist his access to God to please another human being. The third error was mixing the knowledge of the true God with witchcraft. And we see that taking place at Ephesus in church history, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. The fourth error of Balaam was his pride manifested in his desire for the honor of man more than the honor of God. The fifth error was Balaam testing God to see if God would change his opinion if Balaam kept stubbornly insisting after God had already said no. The sixth error of Balaam was making God a limited territorial God. The seventh error of Balaam was willingness to use what we call Bible knowledge concerning the holiness of God to accomplish what he could not through a curse. That is, teaching Balaam how to of Balak how to make God judge his own people. The eighth error was the approval, condoning, and promotion of sexual immorality to accomplish his own ends. We talked about the divination of Balaam. We learned an application of principle that wicked people know that if they put enough pressure on you, eventually you will yield, just like Balak did with Balaam. When you get a no answer to be unrighteous, be careful. You may be dealing with a wicked person no matter how religious they seem to be and they'll test to see what your compromise trigger is. We also saw that the prophecies of Balaam, uh, God had kept alive the memory of the Exodus 40 years earlier. We saw that Balaam mixed witchcraft with his knowledge of the true God, and I would say that is similar to the modern charismatic movement. There's a mixture of witchcraft in the modern charismatic movement with knowledge of the true God, and that's manifested by many of the TV preachers. We looked at Numbers 24, which contained the blessing of Balaam, uh, that he pronounced on Israel because God made him do it. The very next chapter, chapter 25, tells us how he managed to get his reward. He used sex connected with pagan worship, and we'll learn more about that uh, fornication when we look at the church of Pergamos, but we saw that specific narrative in Numbers. It's clear from the New Testament that Balaam was personally responsible for what happened in Numbers 25, and in that chapter, you remember, there were 24,000 people who died in a plague until Phineas rammed Zimri and Cosby through with a javelin while they were fornicating in a tent right outside the tabernacle. That just boggles the mind, the, the immense chutzpah of that kind of thing. Chutzpah is the Hebrew unmitigated gall. So he's doing that right next to the tabernacle. Uh, but, he, you know, uh, Zimri was a prince in Israel and Cosby was a princess of Moab. And they thought they, they were important people so they could get away with it. A lot of important people think they can get away with that kind of stuff. And as you know from all the stuff you've probably been hearing on the radio and watching TV and the internet and whatever, there are all kinds of people getting nailed right now for uh, sexual immorality using their positions of power over others under them uh, to take advantage of those people. Although I think a lot of the stuff is going on that's fake too. But anyway, they learned better. They couldn't get away with it when Phineas skewered them both through with one spear stuck into the ground. There they were on the ground, fornicating. He just took the javelin, go whomp, 
rammed right through them, and God stopped the plague. And then God told Moses to wipe out the Midianites. Numbers 25, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Vex the Midianites and smite them, for they vex you with their wiles, whereby they had beguiled you in the matter of Peor, in the matter of Cosby, the daughter of the prince of Midian, their sister, which was slain in the day of the plague of Peor, for Peor's sake. Now, we did see that Balaam got what he wanted, money and honor, but he only enjoyed it for a short time. But there's something else in that passage that I want to point out tonight, because I'm going to give you a parallel with another good king of Israel, and you'll see how it ties in, I hope, when we get there. But in Numbers 31, it says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Avenge the children of Israel of the Midianites. Very next phrase. Afterward shalt thou be gathered unto thy people. This instance was the last mighty act of Moses before God took him to heaven. And there's some lessons in that. I want to talk about that a little bit tonight because it ties in very well with what's going to go happen in, in Ephesus a little bit later. We studied why God took him home this morning. He failed to obey the word of God precisely when he struck the rock on the second occurrence of producing water from the rock instead of speaking to the rock. We talked about that this morning. The point that I made this morning and it's very important because it relates to our study tonight in the book of Revelation. The point is, God expects precise obedience. No variations. Even if you get frustrated. We also learn something else. And this is very important. God is not obligated to use you again after you sin, although he may. He may use you, as he did with Moses, at least one more mighty time before he takes you home. That may be his way just to emphasize to you and to everyone else that your accomplishments, and I have to pay attention to this for myself too, that your accomplishments are not a way of keeping yourself alive. God said, go out, smite the Midianites, and afterwards I'm going to take you home. And they did. And you know the story. Doing great things for God is not the way to stay alive. You can't bribe God and stay alive. You can't do great things. You can't give lots of money. You can't do all the stuff that the world thinks somehow that's going to make the balance difference with God, so he'll give me a few more years to live. We're going to talk about a man who got a few more years to live tonight. Important servants of God die also on the day that God has appointed for their death. The third thing that we learn is that the death of Balaam coincided. I thought this was fascinating when I began to put the text together. The death of Balaam coincided at approximately the same time with the death of Moses. Those two guys died at about the same time. It's, it's almost like Moses died taking Balaam out. Now, I'm going to make a fourth point also. And this fourth point may seem that I'm getting very far afield from our study in the book of Revelation, but it's not. I think you'll see the horrific connection with the church at Ephesus when we learn their history. What ultimately happened to the church at Ephesus is that their failure to repent resulted in the birth of one of the most apostate religious organizations ever to exist. Now, you may have already guessed it in your mind. But the failure of Ephesus to repent and go back to their first love for Christ resulted in the birth of one of the most apostate religious organizations ever to exist. So now, here we are on this fourth point, and I'm using this as an illustration, which you'll see how it fits a little bit later on, the Lord willing. The fourth thing that we learn is sometimes it is better to die. Say, some better to die. Yeah. Sometimes it's better to die rather than begging for life. 
Did you know that? Does somebody have a Kleenex around here? There used to be a box up here somewhere. But um, anyway, uh, anyway, the fourth thing, better to die rather than begging for life. Good King Hezekiah had to learn that the hard way. Now listen carefully. Good King Hezekiah, thank you very much, begged for his life, and listen, based on his works and faithful service to God. Moses didn't do that. Excuse me. He begged for his life based on his works and his faithful service to God. God granted him his request, but it resulted in horrible destruction. So let me just pause in our narrative about Balaam and Revelation and read this account to you out of 2 Kings. In fact, the account occurs twice in the Bible. It occurs in 2 Kings chapter 20, and it also occurs in the book of Isaiah. 2 Kings chapter 20, verse 1. In those days Hezekiah was sick unto death. And the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amoz, came to him and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. That wasn't a very happy thought for Hezekiah. But God at least gave him time, told him your death is coming, make sure you got your will written, and make sure you got all your affairs in order. But he turned his face to the wall and prayed unto the Lord, saying, Now listen, he's begging on the basis of his works and faithful service. We're going to see more about works and faithful service when we look at the churches in Revelation and how all of them got wiped out. I beseech thee, O Lord, remember how I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart and have done that which is good in thy sight. And Hezekiah wept sore. I don't want to die. I don't want to die. I don't want to die. I've been a good guy. I thought good guys got to live and didn't get judged. You know, Job learned a very similar lesson to this. There are spiritual battles going on that we can't see that are going on that are designed for destruction. And if we are at part of the center of that conflict, we may suffer some things as did Job. We don't know what's happening in the heavenlies, but we know there's a spiritual warfare. We're gonna see that in the battle with Midian. We're gonna talk about prayer and spiritual warfare next Sunday, the Lord willing, in the morning worship service. But Hezekiah begins to cry because he's gonna die. And it came to pass before Isaiah was gone out into the middle court that the word of the Lord came to him saying, turn again and tell Hezekiah, the captain of my people. Now that's the same position that Moses had. The captain of my people. Thus saith the Lord, the God of David, thy father. I have heard thy prayer. I have seen thy tears. Behold, I will heal thee. On the third day thou shalt go up unto the house of the Lord. Now look at verse 6. And I will add to thy days 15 years. And I will deliver thee out and this city out of the hand of the king of Assyria. And I will defend this city for mine own sake and for my servant David's sake. Wow, doesn't that seem good? God didn't just say, you know, get everything ready because you're about to die. This sickness is going to result in your death. Maybe have 24 hours, 48 hours, but, you know, do it now. Take care of it, because you're the dead man. But God listens to his request based on his good deeds, his faithful service. And God says, okay, I'm going to give you 15 more years. Let's see what you're going to do in those 15 years. And Isaiah said, take a lump of figs. And they took it and laid it on the boil, and he recovered. And Hezekiah said unto Isaiah, What shall be the sign that the Lord will heal me, and that I shall go up into the house of the Lord the third day? In other words, well, all you have to do is wait three days. But he wanted a sign. The Jews require a sign. The Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. But God gave him a sign too. Wow, a lot of supernatural stuff going on here. This sign shalt thou have of the Lord, that the Lord will do the thing that he hath spoken, Shall the shadow go forward 10 degrees or go back 10 degrees? And Hezekiah answered, It's a light thing for the shadow to go down 10 degrees. 
Nay, but let the shadow return backward 10 degrees. That's the sundial. And Isaiah the prophet cried unto the Lord, and he brought the shadow 10 degrees backward by which it had gone down in the dial of Ahaz. At that time, Berodach Baladan, the son of Baladan, king of Babylon, sent letters and a present unto Hezekiah, for he heard that Hezekiah had been sick. Now, Hezekiah was a really powerful king. He had lots of other nations that were subjected to him, and we'll see about that in just a moment. And he lost it all. Then Isaiah, oh, and uh, so Isaiah hearkened unto them, and he showed them these messengers from Babylon. He showed them all the house of his precious things, the silver and the gold and the spices and the precious ointment. Hey, guys, come look how great I am. Look how much money I got. Now, wait a minute. Is this a smart thing for a wise man to be doing? If Isaiah, I mean, if uh, Hezekiah had died, this wouldn't have happened. And the precious army, all the house of his armor, he showed them all his military weapons and all that was found in his treasures. There was nothing in his house nor in all his dominion that Hezekiah showed them not. I mean, they couldn't have paid spies to find out all this stuff. Then came Isaiah the prophet unto King Hezekiah and said unto him, What said these men? And from whence came they? And Hezekiah said, <laughs> They came from a far country, even from Babylon. No, this is no big deal for me. I mean, it's a long, long way, way away. And they were just here to you know, say, We hope you get well pretty quick. And he said, What have they seen in thy house? And Hezekiah answered, All the things that are in mine house have they seen. There is nothing among my treasures that I have not showed them. And Isaiah said unto Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord. You're going to lose it all. Ephesus lost it all. We'll see that in a minute. Behold, the days are come that all that is in thine house and that thy fathers have laid up in store unto this day shall be carried into Babylon. Nothing shall be left, saith the Lord. And of thy sons that shall issue from thee, which thou shalt beget, shall they take away, and they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. Ever read the book of Daniel? Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah were eunuchs. And Hezekiah said unto Isaiah, Here's King Hezekiah. Good is the word of the Lord which thou hast spoken. And he said, It is not good. Is it not good if peace and truth be in my days? In other words, I really don't care about the future. I'm only thinking about little old me because I'm going to get 15 more years and this isn't going to happen in my lifetime. Sort of like Keynesian economics. The phrase that's attached to that is, well, in the end, we're all de uh, dead anyway. So it really doesn't matter. Man, what a horrible horrible kind of an attitude to have. Last two verses. And the rest of the acts of Hezekiah and all his might and how he made a pool and a conduit and brought water into the city are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Judah? And Hezekiah slept with his fathers. And then the last phrase. And Manasseh his son reigned in his stead. I don't know how much you know about Manasseh. We're going to see it in just a minute. That same instance that we just read here in 2 Kings, but with a few additional details, is recorded in the prophecy of Isaiah, not just in the historical books. It's included in the major prophet of the Old Testament, the one who himself spoke to Hezekiah. It's in Isaiah chapter 38. In those days was Hezekiah sick unto death, and Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, came unto him and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. And then Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and prayed unto the Lord and said, Remember now, O Lord, I beseech thee how I have walked before thee in truth with a perfect heart. I have done that which is good in thy sight. And Hezekiah wept sore. The word of the Lord comes again to Isaiah, says you can turn back, tell him he's going to get 15 more years, down to verse 5. And then God says, But I'm going to deliver this city out of the king of hand of the king of Assyria I'll defend the city this will be a sign from the Lord the Lord will do the thing that he's spoken I'm going to bring the shadow back 10 degrees 
And then the writing of Hezekiah, king of Judah, when he had been sick and was recovered in his sickness, I said in the cutting off of my days, I shall go to the gates of the grave. I am deprived of the residue of years. So Isaiah is recording the prayer that Hezekiah had prayed. I said, I shall not see the Lord, even the Lord in the land of the living. I shall behold man no more with the inhabitants of the world. Mine age is departed. Man, talks a lot about complaints here, huh? <clears throat> my age is departed. You're moved from me like a shepherd's tent. I've cut off like a weaver of my life. I will cut me off with pining sickness from day even unto night. Will thou make an end of me? I reckon till morning that is a lion. So will he break all my bones. I mean, talk about a guy with a worry warp complex. From day even to night, will thou make an end of me? Now, he's the one that had said, look, God, how many good things I've done. But look what was inside of him. Like a crane or a swallow, so did I chatter. I did mourn as a dove, mine eyes fail, looking upward. O oh Lord, I am oppressed, undertake for me. What shall I say? He hath both spoken unto me, and himself hath done it. I shall go softly in my years, in the bitterness of my soul. O oh Lord, by these things men live, and in all these things, in the life of my spirit, so wilt thou recover me and make me live. Well, anyway, we could read the rest of it. But um, if you read the rest of Isaiah chapter 38, and then read chapter 39, you'll see all the stuff that was inside, uh, inside Hezekiah that was belching out of him at that point. And now we find uh, he does recover. And he has the same response in chapter 39 to the messengers from Merodach, Merodach Baladan, the king of Bal Babylon, uh, that he had from before. Now, listen very carefully. Because it tells us that the next king that reigned after he died was Manasseh. Did you know that if Hezekiah had died, Manasseh would never have been born? If Hezekiah had died, Manasseh would never have been born. Because according to the prophecy and according to all the inscriptions, Hezekiah reigned for another 15 years after the fig plaster incident. The Bible says that Manasseh, his son, who reigned after him, was 12 years old when he began to reign. In other words, he was born three years after the fig incident. He was born to Hezekiah's wife, Hephzibah. And Manasseh was all bad. He was the worst king that Judah ever had. And he was the king that reigned the longest of all the kings of Judah. He reigned for 50 years. That's Manasseh. <laughs> you know, that's uh, amazing as you think about it. It's even worse when you realize that he was the king who killed Isaiah the prophet, who had prophesied about what was going to come. He killed the prophet of his father, Hezekiah. He had Isaiah sawn asunder. Now, most of us think of taking a saw and cutting people in pieces, but that, that's a phrase that's used for having a person torn in four pieces by having horses attached to each of your extremities, one to each leg, one to each arm, and the four of them are then driven in different directions until they pull you in pieces. That's what Manasseh did to the prophet Isaiah. Now, let's take a vote. How many of you think that Manasseh was a bad king? <laughs> we have a few heads going up. <laughs> yeah, Manasseh was a very bad king. He was a very, very bad king. Let me just read you a summary of his miserable life. I could have, you know, typed all this stuff up, but I'm just going to read it. This is out of Unger's Bible Dictionary. According to the, uh, acceding to the throne at the early age of 12, he yielded to the influence of the idolatrous Ahaz party and became in time a determined and even fanatical idolater. As he grew up, he took delight in introducing his kingdom to the superstitions of every heathen country. The high places were restored, the groves were replanted, the altars of Baal and Astarte rebuilt. Astarte was the female sex goddess. He rebuilt the worship of the sun and the moon and all the host of heaven were worshipped. The gods of Ammon, of Moab, and of Edom were zealously worshipped everywhere. Babylonian and Egyptian paganism was rife. Incense and offerings rose on the roofs of the houses to the fabled deities of the heights. Wizards practiced their enchantments 
and the valley of Hinnom was once more disgraced by the hideous statue of Moloch, to whom parents offered up their children as burnt sacrifices. This is all during the reign of Manasseh. In every temple of the Lord stood an image of Astarte, the pagan sex goddess. Oh, people, we're going to see some connections here with what went on with Balaam and with the church at Ephesus. I'm just reading this so you can get a big picture of it. This apostasy did not go unrebuked by the prophets, whom the king endeavored to silence by the fiercest persecutor recorded in the annals of Israel, 2 Kings 21, 2 Kings 24, etc. A full of particulars are preserved by Josephus, who says that executions took place every day. That's in his Antiquity of the Jews, uh, volume 10, section 3, paragraph 1. According to rabbinical tradition, Isaiah was sawn asunder by order of Manasseh, and after his death, the prophet's voice was no more heard till the reign of Josiah. The crimes of Manasseh were not long left unavenged. The Philistines, these were all subject peoples, the Philistines, the Moabites, the Ammonites, who had been tributary to Hezekiah, seemed to have re revolted during Manasseh's reign, Zephaniah 2, 4 through 9, Jeremiah chapters 47 through 49. But the great blow was inflicted by Assyria, from whence an army came to Judea, taking Manasseh prisoner. Manasseh was brought to repentance and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers. God heard his prayer and restored him to his kingdom at Jerusalem. His captivity is supposed to have lasted about a year, and after his return, Manasseh took measures to secure his kingdom, especially the capital, against hostile attacks. And we know his repentance was real because it says, he removed the idols and the statues from the house of the Lord. He caused the idolatrous altars which he had built upon the temple hill and in Jerusalem to be cast forth from the city. He repaired the altar of Jehovah. He called upon the people to serve the Lord God of Israel, but the people still sacrificed in the high places, yet unto the Lord their God only. The next scripture mention of Manasseh is his death and burial in the garden of Uzzah in 2 Kings 21, 2 Chronicles chapter 33, about 641 BC. Now, does it sound pretty bad? But he did repent. So let me tell you something strange. In fact, two strange things. God brought Manasseh to repentance and let him live after all that wickedness. But God killed Moses. Manasseh spent his entire life as king doing wickedness. He was on his way to hell. There's no question about it. But God had mercy on him. Moses, on the other hand, spent his entire life serving God as the greatest Old Testament leader and prophet. I mean, Deuteronomy 18 talks about how the, God is going to raise up a prophet like unto Moses... And to him, they would listen. And that's a reference. We see that in the New Testament to Jesus. Moses, the greatest of the Old Testament prophets and leaders. But Moses only disobeyed God once. And God took him home. Now, I think that emphasizes a couple of things for us. Number one, it emphasizes the mercy of God on the lost. But it also emphasizes that God expects obedience from those who know him well, from those who are his own, from those who know him personally and intimately. Godly leaders are more accountable before God than wicked leaders whom God may save by his grace. There's a lot to ponder in those two instances. Hezekiah lived beyond his time and brought captivity because he begged for more life. He bought more time with that, but he brought captivity to God's people and the pilfering of the Jewish treasures at Jerusalem. His extended life produced the worst king that Judah ever had. Hezekiah got his heart's desire but it produced five things, chaos and ruin, suffering, wickedness, and misery. The whole Hezekiah incident is an exact reflection of the wilderness wanderings of the children of Israel that we've been studying on Sunday mornings. Hezekiah had a carnal request that God granted 
but it ended in horrible destruction. Israel's constant carnal demands also ended in their death in the wilderness. God gave them their carnal demands, but simultaneously sent spiritual starvation to their souls, and they continued to wander. Now, I don't have to guess whether or not that application is correct and the parallel is correct, because Psalm 106 says it specifically. Reciting the events surrounding the crossing of the Red Sea, here's what David wrote 450 years later after the crossing of the Red Sea. David, the ancestor of Hezekiah. Psalm 106, starting in verse 13. And the whole context here is the crossing of the Red Sea. You read the whole psalm, you'll see that. They soon forget his works. They waited not for his counsel, but lusted exceedingly in the wilderness and tempted God in the desert. Now verse 15. Just like with Hezekiah. And he gave them their request, but sent leanness into their soul. You know, God gave Balaam his request too, finally. He said, all right, go with them. Let's see what happens. They kept pushing God, and God gave them their request. But he sent leanness to their soul. He sent death to them. He granted Balaam's request, but he sent death to him. He granted Hezekiah's request, but it was a carnal request. He gave him 15 more years of life, but he produced the worst king that Judah ever had, the southern kingdom. Kingdom is divided at this point, divided in the days of Rehoboam, son of Solomon. Hezekiah is after that. Okay, so back to our text now. Here we have the death of Balaam. They're going out against Midian. God has told him, go kill Midian. So Moses speaks to the people, arm yourselves for war. Some of you go against the Midianites, avenge the Lord of Midian. So they choose a thousand out of each tribe. And then it says in verse 8, they slew the kings of Midian beside the rest of them that were slain. Evi and Rechem and Zur and Hur and Reba, five kings of Midian. Balaam also the son of Beor, they slew with a sword. He didn't have his money for long. They saved the women and children alive. And then in verse 16, behold, these caused the children of Israel. Moses said, what, you saved the women alive? These caused the children of Israel through the counsel of Balaam to commit a trespass against the Lord in the matter of Peor, and there was a plague among the congregation of the Lord. Now, last week we also looked at the New Testament. I added that stuff about Hezekiah tonight because I want you to see now that we're moving back into the New Testament what actually took place at Ephesus. Balaam is an example of wickedness for four reasons. You remember the reasons I gave you last week. Number one, he abandoned godly separation. That has been a key marker in this church. Separation. It's an important marker. It's an essential marker. Balaam abandoned it. Two, he deliberately defiled morally pure character. We've talked about that in some of the things that have happened here in the past. Three, he clutched at worldly conformity. He wanted to be like the world. Four, he taught a perversion of what we call today Christian liberty. He taught licentiousness. And as we get over to Pergamos a little bit later, church number three, we'll see that that's what's going on over at Pergamos. The decadent moral teaching is seen in the matter of Peor, Peor where he taught Balak to send in the beautiful girls of Moab to commit fornication with the Israelites so that God himself would judge them, even though Balaam couldn't curse them. Now, last week, we read both Jude and Peter where he is set out as the epitome of apostasy, and he tells you all the different things that went on, and he mentions, for example, Sodom and Gomorrah. He mentions uh, the fact that they're in hell now. He talks about the angels who left their first estate. Uh, he talks about the children of Israel coming out of Egypt, so he ties it right back. I mean, here's Jude, and he's using those as illustrations. We're going to see that same connection when we see the history of Ephesus. Woe unto them, for they've gone in the way of Cain. They ran greedily after the heir of Balaam for reward and perished in the gainsaying of Kor. And then he talks about how they creep into churches, how they come to your you know, church dinners. Uh, they think that nobody's ever going to figure out who they are. And then he tells you about what they do, raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame-wandering stars, to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. And these are people who are in Bible-preaching churches. And then he talks about the return of Christ in verses 14 and following. But he tells you that these people are murmurers, complainers. You know, when you find murmurers in a church, 
be careful, you may have some of the apostates, you may have some of the apostates that are parallel to Balaam, walking after their own lusts. When you have people that flatter you, who like to gossip, speaking great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration become of advantage, remember what happened to Balaam. Remember the words that were spoken before the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how they told you there would be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lusts. What's the key word that describes them? Very next verse, sensual, having not the spirit. Peter talks about them as well. And he talks about Balaam. And he talks about the horrible immoral practices. He talks about the covetousness. He talks about their eyes full of adultery, how they cannot cease from sin. These are the ones who are like Balaam. So that's the horrible background of Balaam and the Nicolaitans and the prophesied defection of the church at Ephesus. That was a doctrinally sound church. We've already studied that. God prophesied, if you don't go back to your first love, I'm going to jerk you out. Ephesus was the most doctrinally sound church among the seven churches. Now let's see what happened at Ephesus 400 years after the prophecy was given by Jesus to the Apostle John in Revelation 2. How they got into false doctrine that ended in the horrible false practices like Israel and like Balaam and like Hezekiah and the rest of the passages that I just used to set the stage. As you know, I hope you know anyway, in the early church, there were multiple councils that were called to hammer out basic doctrine that was believed by the church and to stop the spread of heresy and apostasy. Did you know that Ephesus was one of the locations chosen for one of the early church councils? Now, Ephesus clearly had no excuse for allowing false doctrine to creep in for at least five reasons. Here are five reasons that Ephesus was without excuse. Number one, think about it. Paul had started that church. Number two, and we could add, that Paul not only started that church, but he preached there for two years. Number two, Paul had ordained the elders at Ephesus. Number three, Paul had written that incredible book of the Ephesians to that church. Number four, and this is something you don't see in the text of the scripture, but we discover it from church history, studying the ancient writers. Did you know that church history records for us that Timothy was ordained the first bishop of Ephesus close to the time of the death of the apostle Paul? Timothy. These guys had no excuse. Number five, Christ himself commended the church 30 years later on their firm doctrinal stance in the book of Revelation when he warned them about the consequences of losing their first love. This church maintained their basic Bible doctrine for at least half a century. And they didn't waver on it. Those five incredible privileges are privileges that any church that's a Bible-believing church would be envious of. So how did the devil finally get to the church at Ephesus? Let me give you a hint. On New Year's Day, just two and a half months ago, January 1st, 2018, Pope Francis preached in St. Peter's Basilica for the so-called, quote, Feast of Mary, the Mother of God. 28 years ago, Back in 1965, Pope Paul VI proclaimed Mary the mother of the church. But it goes back even farther than that. One of that earliest church councils I mentioned a moment ago was the Council of Ephesus in 431 AD. It was the Council of Ephesus that invented the position, the exaltation of Mary. That happened at Ephesus, 431. The council at Ephesus was the first church council to apply the term Mother of God to Mary. 
That was at Ephesus, folks. The place that was the most doctrinally sound of all the seven churches in Revelation. But that was the church that had lost its first love for Christ. But there's more. At Ephesus, where was one of the ancient permutations, was where one of the ancient permutations of worshiping the so-called Queen of Heaven was central to the pagan worship that surrounded the church. Now remember, Balaam was mixing paganism and witchcraft with knowledge of the true God. It was a place where the worshipers gathered to have orgies with temple prostitutes as part of their worship. Does that ring any bells about the doctrine of Balaam and how he got Israel to sin so that he could get paid? Does that ring any bells about the orgies Israel got involved with at Baal Peor, remember? Numbers 25, and Israel board in Shittim, Shittim, and the people began to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab, and they called the people unto the sacrifices of their gods. This is the prostitute, temple prostitute orgy kind of stuff that was going on. And the people did eat and bow down to their gods. And Israel joined himself unto Baal Peor, that is, the Lord Baal means Lord or Master of Peor, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. Now, are you beginning to understand the connection to the church at Ephesus in Revelation 2 and why they were warned about their love for Christ? You're going to love something, folks. You are going to love something. You're built that way. What is it you're going to love? You better make sure that you keep strengthening the love for Christ. Because love without love for Christ, sound doctrine eventually erodes into pagan sex orgies and erotic sensual love for pagan gods. And that is how the devil finally got them, by pulling them into the worship of Mary. But you say, well, was there anything at Ephesus that focused on, on temp temple goddess ritual prostitutes? And the answer is yes, a resounding yes. The book of Acts records it for us. Acts chapter 19. And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coasts, came to Ephesus. And finding certain disciples, they're the disciples who believed that Jesus was coming, they'd only heard about him though through John's baptism he said have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed and they said unto him we have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost and he said unto them under what then were you baptized and they said unto, and they said unto John's baptism then said Paul John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance so now remember we're starting out with a bunch of really good guys here these are guys who've been followers of John the Baptist now they're about to discover that Jesus has come the Messiah is actually here there are 12 of these guys that makes for a minyan, uh, uh, the minimum amount of uh, men that you need to start a synagogue. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance. In other words, repent from your sins. In other words, run away from all that pagan stuff. Run away from all that immoral stuff. Run away from all that stuff that's polluting you. Saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Ghost came upon them. They spake in tongues and prophesied, and all the men were about twelve. Now, from that point on, Paul begins to preach in the synagogue. He preaches in the synagogue for a time, and you know the devil is silent during the time he's preaching in the synagogue because that means that his preaching isn't being spread to the surrounding pagans. Verse 8, he went into the synagogue and spake boldly for the space of three months, disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. But when divers were hardened and believed not, but spake evil of the way before the multitude, he departed from them and separated the disciples, disputing daily in the school of one Tyrannus, which is right next to the synagogue. <laughs> People were listening over the wall. And this continued by the space of two years. He was there for two years, basically without opposition. So that all they which dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. And God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul, so that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons, and diseases departed from them, and evil spirits went out of them. I mean, look, was Ephesus a place that saw the power of God? Yes or no? Yes! And this 
is the church, the city, the location where we first find a church council calling Mary the mother of God. 431 A.D. Now, the devil hadn't fought Paul up to this point. He let him preach in the synagogues. But it's starting to get out. And so we can see that there's clearly demonic activity at Ephesus. It had infiltrated the synagogue, in fact, the place where the Jewish God was supposed to be worshipped. The devil didn't make himself plain in the synagogue at this point. But he did at last. There was a Balaam mixture that had already occurred at Ephesus, just like the Balaam teaching of the Old Testament as we learned from verse 13 and following. Here we have Acts 19, verse 13. Then certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call over them which had an evil spirit the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, We adjure you by the Spirit, uh, by Jesus, whom Paul preacheth. Verse 14. And there were seven sons of one Sceva, a Jew. Now this is at Ephesus and chief of the priests. Now the synagogue was where they were supposed to be worshiping the true God. When Paul left the synagogue because there were people who were opposing him, I suspect this was part of the group that was opposing him. But they thought, you know, Paul's doing these miracles. Why don't we try the magic trick? A mixture of the knowledge of the true God with witchcraft, just like we saw with Balaam and the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Same thing is going on here at Ephesus. They had started out hating the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, but eventually it came in to the church at Ephesus because they'd lost their first love. There were seven sons of one Sceva, a Jew, and the chief of the priests which did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are ye? And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them and overcame them and prevailed against them. One guy beat up seven guys. So they fled out of the house naked and wounded. He not only beat them up, he ripped off their clothes. And this was known to all the Jews and Greeks also dwelling at Ephesus. And fear fell on them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. So we see right here at the very beginning, there's a very clear initial separation of the Ephesian church to true doctrine and the abandonment of pagan practices. We see them clearly abandoning it. Did you know, you remember, I hope you remember from Acts 19, verse 18, and many of them believed came, so these are people who are getting saved, both Jews and Greeks. Many of them that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. Many of them also which used curious arts, that is witchcraft, brought their books together and burned them before all men, and they counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. These people were serious about true doctrine and godly practice. That's Ephesus, folks. The first place Jesus sent a letter. In 96 AD, they were still sound in doctrine. They hadn't defected at that point. They hated the deeds of the Nicolaitans. They had only one weakness. They'd lost their first love. Have you lost your first love? So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed, and after these things were ended, Paul pur purposed in the spirit when he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia to go to Jerusalem, saying, After I have been there, I must also see Rome. So he sent into Macedonia two of them that ministered unto him, Timotheus and Erastus, but he himself stayed in Asia for a season. Now, it's at that point when he loses his right hand and left hand man, it's at that point that we get to the heart of the paganism surrounding the church at Ephesus which was fertility goddess worship of the worst sort. The church at Ephesus knew what that was about. And they had at the beginning separated themselves from it. Verse 23. The same time there arose no small stir about that way. For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, which made silver shrines for Diana, brought no small gain unto the craftsmen, whom he called together with the workmen of like occupation and said, Sirs, ye know by this craft we have our wealth. <laughs> 
Love of money is the root of all evil. Balaam wanted money. Balaam said, the way we get money is this, the way the Moabites worship their God is with sex. Get the boys involved in it, they'll worship the gods of Baal Peor and God will judge them. Here's Demetrius. What do we got? He's making shrines for Diana. Diana was a sex goddess of the Greeks. She's paralleled, as we'll see some other Babylonian and Egyptian gods, too, who are also sex goddesses. But um, let me get back to the text here for a moment. You know that by this craft we have our wealth. It's an issue of money. Moreover, you see in here that not alone at Ephesus, but almost throughout all Asia, this Paul hath persuaded and turned away many, much people, saying that there be no gods which are made with hands, so that not only this craft is in this our craft is in danger of being set at naught, but also that the temple of the great goddess Diana should be despised, and her magnificence should be destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worshipeth. Now there's a little bit of hype in that. And when they heard these sayings, they were full of wrath and cried out, saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. And the whole city was filled with confusion. And having caught Gaius and Aristarchus, men of Macedonia, Paul's companions in travel, they rushed with one accord into the theater. And when Paul would have entered into the people, the disciples suffered him not. And certain of the chief of Asia, which were his friends, sent unto him, desiring him that he would not adventure himself into the theater. Some therefore cried one thing and some another, for the assembly was confused. The more part knew what they were did not know what they were come together for. And they drew Alexander out of the multitude, and the Jews put him forward. And Alexander beckoned with the hand and would have made his defense unto the people. When they knew that he was a Jew, all with one voice about the space of two hours cried out, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. Now look, we have a mother goddess here who's a fertility goddess. A mother goddess who's a fertility goddess. It causes a riot at Ephesus. Ephesus. Because Paul is teaching there's not a god that you're supposed to be worshiping. And they say hey, it's cutting into our business profits. They start a riot. The whole town gathers at the big, huge stadium there. And for two hours they yell, Great is Diana of the Ephesians! Great is Diana of the Ephesians! And, you know, the guy standing on the stage trying to quiet him down so he can make a defense. And when the town clerk had appeased the people, he, he said, Ye men of Ephesus, what man is there that knoweth not how that the city of the Ephesians is a worshiper of the great goddess Diana and of the image which fell down from Jupiter? A big, huge, multi-noded, that is, had nodes all over it, uh, meteorite had crashed near that site. And the Ephesians said, oh, that's from Diana, and those are her breasts. And you can see statues of Diana of the Ephesians that are still in the museums today where she's carved there, and she has dozens of breasts hanging from her. She was a, a sex goddess, a fertility goddess that was being worshipped there at Ephesus. Seeing then that these things cannot be spoken against, he said, well, we've got physical proof right here. <laughs> well, if that's what you accept. You ought to be quiet and not to do anything rashly, for you have brought hither these men which are neither robbers of churches nor yet blasphemers of your goddess. Wherefore, if Demetrius and the craftsmen which are with him have a matter against any man, the law is open, there are deputies, let them implead one another. There's no sue at law. But if you inquire any other matters, it shall be determined in a lawful assembly. For we are in danger to be called in question this day uproar. Man, I can't believe the time is gone. There being no cause whereby we may give an account for this concourse, and when he had thus spoken, he dismissed the assemble, assembly. Pagan sex goddess worship. That's what we have going on with Balaam and Israel. That's what Manasseh son of Hezekiah brought in and he was the longest reigning and worst king Judah ever had and he brought it into Jerusalem that's what we see going on with the Nicolaitans we'll learn more about that when we get over to Pergamos but that's what ultimately took Ephesus 431 Pagan sex Scottish worship. Okay, so what about today? Are you aware that research shows that in most evangelical Bible-believing churches today, approximately one-half 
of the men and many women are involved in online pornography? That's not the, the liberals down the street from us here. I mean, who knows what the statistics are on them. These are research statistics done by Christian organizations that are counseling men in churches all over the United States. If you want, I can print out some of that stuff. I mean, you know, there's an entire series that has been put out designed to help Christian men who are really saved get out of the addiction, the horrible, filthy sin of pornography. I get various emails from them, you know, saying, if you've got men in your church who have this problem, you know, get our materials here. You can help the men get out of it. You know, a number of years ago, I preached on that subject. I passed out Slaying the Dragon of Lust, a DVD that, you know, I gave to every man in the church at that time. Because pornography is killing America, and pornography is killing the American church. The worship of the pagan sex goddess of lust. Nearly half of the evangelical men are involved in online pornography. That's merely the digital version of the ancient perversions that we see manifested in the Balaam incident and the Ephesus decay. And it will destroy a church. It will rot it from the inside out, just like it did at Ephesus. Now, I don't have time tonight, but I want to talk more about the Queen of Heaven next week and the infiltration of Mary, Mother of God, which came in at Ephesus and what happened at that church, the Lord willing, next week. Let's close in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for your mercy and kindness, but we are reminded once again tonight that a doctrinally sound church can rot from the inside out. A church that has taken strong stands in the past against the wicked pagan immorality of the society around it. A church that knows its dangers. But if it loses its first love for Christ, it will go that direction. That's why Paul, or John, mentions the Nicolaitans and why he mentions Balaam in his letter to the church at Ephesus. Cause us to have sober minds, Father. Cause us to have pure minds. Cause us to have minds that are focused on Jesus and increase our love for him. More love to thee, O Christ. More love to thee. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.